Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> Good evening. <laughs> uh, I'm Daniel Benjamin. I'm the president of the American Academy in Berlin. I apologize for being a tiny bit hoarse, but um, I promise not to uh, not to uh, harm anyone. Um, uh, I'm really um, delighted that you could join us for tonight's inaugural Bertolt Beit's lecture entitled uh, A Wiser World, The Global Quest for Good Judgment, which will be delivered by our fellow Zach Zachary Shore. So um, I have a slightly longer introductory remarks than usual because this is a special event, the inaugural lecture in a, in a new fellowship. But let me just say how pleased I am, really delighted to have Zach with us as our first ever Bites Fellow. And given what he is working on, I think it seems um, a perfect fit. So the Bertolt Bites Fellowship is the newest addition uh, to the roster of named American Academy Fellowships. Uh, and we are hugely thankful to the Alfred Krupp von Bolen und Halbach Foundation for funding this fellowship. And um, in line with that, it is a particular pleasure to wel welcome uh, Dr. Ursula Gater, I should say, Professor, Dr. Doctor, yeah, uh, Chair of the Curatorium or the Board of Trustees of the Krupp Foundation uh, to the American Academy tonight. Without her support for this effort, I can assure you, it never would have happened. Thank you so much, Ursula, for uh, joining us and for supporting this fellowship, which honors an outstanding man. And you and the Stiftung support and manage so many other projects in the arts, culture, education, science and health that we couldn't be more pleased uh, that you found the American Academy to be a worthy partner. I should also say I'm particularly grateful to my uh, trustee, unfortunately not here, uh, Carol Kahn Strauss, uh, who knows everyone in Germany and introduced me to Ursula and it would be inappropriate to go on without mentioning her. So uh, about the man for whom this fellowship is named, Bertolt Beitz was without question one of the most distinguished Germans of the second half of the 20th century. And at the time of his death, aged almost 100, late 99, in 2013, The Economist hailed Beitz as the last great German industrial baron. He joined Krupp, the centuries-old steel and arms firm, in 1953 and helped raise it from the ruins of World War II. Beitz worked to restore the firm's reputation after its leader was imprisoned as a war criminal during the, from his, what he had done during the Nazi period. Bertolt Beitz stirred the, steered the firm through a period of rapid technological change and profoundly intense global competition. Um, the revitalization he engineered uh, of the company with his team saw the company through two large mergers and its ultimate emergence as Tucson Krupp, one of the few winners in a harrowing period for coal and steel firms. But um, Bites was much more than an industrial manager. He was also a major figure on the world stage whose economic diplomacy, uh, particularly in Poland, Hungary, and eventually Moscow, provided in the, world, in the words of historian Harold James, quote, a substantial underpinning to the Ostpolitik of Chancellor Willy Braun. Bites also opened up new markets for German exports in Latin America, India, and China, where he was one of the early people to have the pleasure of meeting Zhou Enlai. This record of accomplishment would be remarkable by itself, but Bertolt Bites stands out as a towering figure in his era because of the things he did that had nothing to do with business, and um, specifically the extraordinary record of his actions during World War II. In Borislav, a part of Poland that I believe is now part of Ukraine, he used his position as director of an important oil operation uh, together with his wife Elsa and saved the lives of an estimated 800 Jews. Um, <clears throat> he, um, he did this by insisting to the SS that particular Jews were required for the operations of the oil works he once uh, pulled 250 people off a train headed for Belzich, where they would have been exterminated at great personal risk. Uh, he and his wife hid Jews in their home and tipped off others in the community when they learned that uh, an aktion was imminent. For these deeds, Bertolt and Elsa Beitz are honored as righteous among the nations uh, at, 
at Israel's Yad Vashem Holocaust Memorial, uh, which is a truly extraordinary designation. <clears throat> the American Academy in Berlin uh, is um, thrilled to have a tradition of honoring outstanding individuals who have distinguished themselves in Germany and the US with programs named for the, Amer the German American historian Fritz Stern, the German American philanthropist Anna Maria Kellen, former German president Richard von Weizsäcker, industrialist and philanthropist Bertolt Leibinger, former US ambassador Richard Holbrook, and others. And in our pavilion, we have studies that we have named after Hannah Arendt, Eric Kessner, Walter Benjamin, and Helmut Kohl, among others. The Academy firmly believes that Bertolt Beitz should be recognized among these giants. He was a rare bright light in a dark time, and we are thrilled to honor his life and legacy through the Bertolt Beitz Fellowship at the American Academy in Berlin. So now to our inaugural Beitz Fellows, Zachary Shore. Zach is a scholar whom it is fair to say everyone wants a part of. He is professor of history at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, senior fellow at the Institute of European Studies at the University of California, Berkeley, or as we all know, it should be called simply Cal, and a National Security Visiting Fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford. I think we ran out of Bay Area institutions, no? Um, Zach received a, a master's from the University of Virginia and a PhD in modern history, I guess a DPhil in modern history. How could we have got that wrong? Uh, from Oxford. He was, uh, he has, he, he has um, government experience as a member of the policy planning staff of the State Department where he specialized <clears throat> in European affairs and transatlantic relations. Uh, just as an aside, it's notable that the Academy now has two policy planning uh, alums in one semester, Michael Kimmage, who spoke last week, is the other. I don't think we've had any others in my four years, and I find this rather suspicious. <laughs> <clears throat> in 2002 and three, Zach was a Daimler Chrysler Bosch Foundation Fellow at the American Institute of Contemporary German Studies, an institute we're very friendly with, <clears throat> before he became a senior fellow at the Institute of European Studies. Um, at Cal in 2003. He has written six books, and um, he will tell you more about them during uh, his presentation. But it's safe to say that in an era when many complain about academic writing becoming ever narrower, um, Zach is having none of it. <clears throat> Among his titles, This Is Not Who We Are, America's Struggle Between Vengeance and Virtue, a Blunder, Why Smart People Make Bad Decisions, I wish I'd read that 40 years ago. <laughs> and um, uh, A Sense of the Enemy, the High Stakes History of Reading Your Rival's Mind. Uh, Zach, it is safe to say, is thinking and writing big. He has also published numerous articles in such, uh, in such uh, publications as Time, Foreign Policy, and uh, a variety of others. He has a basket full of fellowships and awards, um, too numerous to go into. During his time in Berlin, he is working <clears throat> on wisdom through uh, modern history and the circumstances that produce it. And I confess, when I first looked at Zach's application, I was a little shocked. I was like, oh, he's going to tell us about wisdom, is he? Uh, but the more I read, uh, the more I found myself nodding and the more eager I was to have him at the academy. And after all, isn't that exactly what we're supposed to be pursuing? So I'm glad Zach is leading the way. So Zach will speak for about 30 minutes, uh, after which I will join him on stage um, to um, uh, draw more wisdom from him. And uh, we'll have a Q&A. And if you're here, raise your hand. If you're not, please type your question in the Q&A box before, um, I'm sorry, below, after accepting the pop-up. And now let me make the very sage, I might even say wise decision, and give the uh, podium to Zach. Oh. Thank you so much. I, I forgot to mention, I'm so remiss, when you put a big note on your, on your, on your talk and you don't look at it, 
Um, today is the 111th birthday of Bertolt Bites. Daniel, thank you so much for those very kind words. And uh, I have to give a special thanks to the Alfred Krupp von Bolden and Holbach Stiftung for making this fellowship possible and allowing me to begin the research on this project. Uh, also thanks to the Academy staff and fellows who have made this an absolutely wonderful experience so far. And one more thanks to Linda Rossi in the back who's going to be helping us with the audiovisual material tonight. So, uh, with that, I'd like to introduce you to a few people. This first person, some of you might recognize, his name is Sorense Kama. And he was the first president of an independent Botswana, a country roughly the size of France and Southern Africa. But Sorense Kama actually became famous long before he became president. And that's because as a young man, he traveled to England to study law. And while there, he fell in love. He fell in love with a white English woman. And uh, her name was Ruth Williams. They met at a party and just instantly clicked. Sometimes you just know, and they knew. And so after a year of dating, Soretze proposed and Ruth accepted, and many, many people were opposed to this union. To say that an interracial marriage uh, was frowned upon in the 1940s would be somewhat of an understatement. Uh, however, probably the most apoplectic about it was the South African regime. That's because Soretsi Kama was not your average law student. He was also the grandson of Kama III, which meant that Soretsi was in line to become Hosi, or tribal chief of Bechuanaland, the uh, place, his homeland, which that was its name before it became independent and became Botswana. So <clears throat> the South African government pressured Great Britain to keep Soretse from coming back to Africa. They were absolutely horrified at the thought that racist apartheid regime did not want an interracial couple to be atop the political hierarchy in a neighboring land. So they pressured the Brits, and the Brits kept Soretze away from his homeland for six years. And now why were the Brits so vulnerable to pressure from the South Africans? Uranium, in a word, that's for one. There were other reasons. But the Brits needed South Africa's uranium in order to build up their nascent nuclear forces in the early Cold War. So for six years, they stonewalled, manipulated, humiliated, and eventually, uh, actually flat out lied to Soretze Kama and Ruth until he was exhausted. And then they struck a deal. Soretze would be allowed to go home and take Ruth with him, but only on one condition. He had to renounce all rights to become Hosi, the tribal chief, therefore relinquish his birthright. He agreed. They went home. And then within a few years, Soretze Kama realized that Bechuanaland needed a modern political process and modern political parties. And so he launched a democratic party, was easily elected its head. And now, atop the political hierarchy again, uh, look, given the way that the Brits had treated him and Ruth for so long, and given the wave of anti-imperial sentiment that was sweeping across Africa in the 1960s, you can really see how the stage was set for another wrenching a very rocky relationship with Great Britain. But that's not what happened. Instead, Soretze Kama decided that conflict was not a profitable course for his people or himself, and that they needed to change course, get off that path. And so Botswana achieved its independence peacefully. And more than this, Soretze Kama did something highly unusual he negotiated with the diamond mining company De Beers to ensure that a substantial portion of revenues 
from diamond sales would remain in Botswana and funneled into the public good to build up infrastructure, uh, health care, and above all, education. It was a remarkably wise decision because it transformed Botswana from one of the poorest countries in the world to a real success story, raising living standards uh, and also bringing political stability. So was this the result purely of Sarete Kama's wisdom? Or were other factors at play? Was it the so-called great man theory of history? Or was there something else happening here? Let's meet a different figure. This person, I'll be very surprised if anyone here can recognize, unless you're an expert in Vietnamese politics or history. His name is Chuang Chin, and he was one of the early general secretaries of the Vietnamese Workers' Party. Uh, he was also a doctrinaire Marxist. In the 1950s, he spearheaded a land reform program that was so ideologically extreme and violent that, well, we don't actually know how many people died in the process, but our best estimates right now are around 100,000 Vietnamese villagers. People were murdered just for owning a tiny plot of land or some livestock. The entire episode was so awful that Ho Chi Minh actually had to remove Comrade Chung from his position and Ho apologized to the entire country for the debacle. But Comrade Chung remained doctrinaire and he remained a leader in the party, more behind the scenes, for decades. Until the 1980s, and then something happened. He decided that the old policies no longer suited and that Vietnam had to change course. He decided that they had to adopt market reforms. Uh, we now know that Chung Chin was one of the driving forces and very possibly the driving force behind the Mui, or renovation, the transition to a market economy. That decision, of course, has transformed Vietnam, making it not only much wealthier and more prosperous, but also more powerful in the international arena. Let's meet one last figure. This man's name is Augustus Gusty Spence. He was not a head of state, not a president, but in fact was a convicted murderer. Now, Spence was part of the Ulster Volunteer Force, a paramilitary band of Protestants in Northern Ireland. And he was given a life sentence for the murder of a teenage Catholic boy. I do think you can learn a lot from photos of people but to be honest, I like to hear how they sound. And so I'd like to play for you a brief 30-second clip of an interview he gave with the BBC in 1972. But one caution, his accent is quite strong. You may not understand every word he says, but that's not important. Don't focus so much on the words. What I want you to do is try to get a feeling for the person from the sound of his voice. Linda, let's play that clip. military force with no allegiance to any particular party. You've got guns? Yes. And you're prepared to use them? True. And you have used them? Yes. When? On various occasions. Against? Against anyone who would usurp the constitution of Ulster. You also formed... Now, when I hear him, I get the sense of an ice cold killer probably not someone you would think would be appropriate in a discussion about wisdom. But then something happened. Between 1972 and 77, while in prison, Gusty Spence became radicalized, radicalized for peace. And he became so convinced that Northern Ireland's path forward could only come through a peaceful process that he convinced other key Protestant leaders of the same thing. And he, together with the others, were absolutely crucial to the forming of the, of the uh, Good Friday Agreement, which brought an end to that decades-long bloody conflict. So what happened in these three cases? After all, they happened on different continents, in different decades, and under extremely different historical and cultural conditions. Were they all sui generis, just products of their own particular local circumstances? Or could there actually be some common threads that link 
these three cases of wise governmental decisions? And is it even possible that there are patterns that connect not only these three cases, but many other cases of wise decisions as well? I want to find out. <laughs> it is a quest that will take me around the world and back in time in my search for a wiser world, a global quest for good judgment. I really wanted some fireworks to go off when I said that, but I <laughs> thought that might be overkill. Okay. All right. Well, we have to get serious now because we have some very tough topics to tackle tonight. Namely, what produces wisdom? Where does it come from? And how can we get it? A lot of very smart people have been thinking about this for a rather long time. Millennia, in fact, from Aristotle and Lao Tzu to uh, John Rawls and Thomas Scanlon and many, many more. And isn't it just so wonderfully human that after all these centuries, we still can't agree? I mean, we can't even agree sometimes on who is wise, much less what makes someone wise. Well, maybe part of the problem is that we don't neatly divide into wise and foolish people. I think most of us, actually probably all of us, will make some wise and foolish decisions throughout our lifetimes. So what if there's a way to cut the Gordian knot of this tricky puzzle? I always think when the answer proves elusive, change the question. <laughs> so maybe instead of asking what produces wisdom, we should be asking what produces wise decisions? Because if we could just focus on crafting wise solutions, then maybe we don't have to worry about becoming wise at all. Maybe we can enjoy all the benefits without all the fuss. That's, that sounds good to me. So, I have to tell you something. This is a very unusual talk for me because normally, when I give a book talk or talk about my research, it's after I've already written the book and done the research. <laughs> but I've only been here a month, if that. And I'm only at the very beginning, the embryonic stage of this project. And so I can't give you the typical uh, clear thesis and argument that I would lay out and defend. I don't have that yet. So what I'll do instead is invite you into my thinking process and let you see how I'm working through this puzzle. And then I'm going to try to harness the brain power in this room. <laughs> so you're going to be on call. Come the Q&A session, I'm hoping that uh, maybe you'll have ideas for uh, cases I might consider and maybe even thoughts about how to think about wisdom. But for now, let me tell you how I've been thinking about it. When a government sets out to craft a wise policy, I would think that it should have the following four key elements. Insight, in order to perceive the roots of a problem. Prudence, to know how best to approach a problem. Creativity, to help solve the problem and pragmatism to help you implement the solution. So insight, prudence, creativity, and pragmatism. And when I look at historical cases of wise decisions in government, I find that they contain absolutely none of those qualities. I, I, I mean, they bear absolutely no resemblance to the tidy package I just gave you because governments just don't work that way, do they? I mean, that's because most politicians don't get up each morning and say, how can I be insightful, creative, pragmatic, and prudent in order to better serve the people? <coughs> no, my friends, unfortunately, not all, but too many, will think, how can I undercut my rivals, humiliate the opposition, uh, burnish my reputation, and grasp harder onto power? Obviously, we're very lucky in that many, many people who work in government genuinely do want to do the right thing. So given this tension between the selfish and the selfless and everyone in between, it's pretty remarkable that governments do sometimes produce some profoundly wise decisions. I wanna know how. When I actually look at how these decisions have come about historically, I find that they contain three entirely different features or factors that help them come about. And I'm gonna tell you what they are, but not just yet, because I need to create what we call narrative tension. <laughs> So, I want to keep you engaged. So, the rest of this talk will divide uh, into three simple parts. Part one, background. I want to talk to you about some of my previous work and how it has shaped my thinking about wisdom. Part two, story time. I want to dig a little deeper into one particular story of a wise decision 
that is relevant to both America and Germany, and to Europe more broadly, actually. Uh, and then three, the wrap-up. I will try to tie together some of these thoughts into a, maybe not neat, but at least some kind of coherent package. So, with that, let me turn to part one and uh, talk about some of the background. But my Braille note cards are telling me, pause here for drink of water. So I will now do that. Give me a brief moment. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Most of my work, five of my six books, have dealt with governmental decision-making in one form or another. Uh, and I want to share with you just a quick summary. I'll say a little bit more about some of them than others <clears throat> to help you see what I, what I learned from them. So let's turn to book number one, What Hitler Knew, The Battle for Information in Nazi Foreign Policy. And this was the outgrowth of my doctoral dissertation at Oxford. And I was asking, how did Hitler make decisions? Or more specifically, how did his regime make decisions of foreign policy? And what I found was, here's the thesis right up front, in a nutshell, Hitler's power to make informed decisions was limited by the very system he created. So what I did was I focused on the climate of fear within the regime and how that shaped the behavior of the diplomats. Now realize that the diplomats were not Nazis in the beginning. They were old school Weimar era elites, aristocrats, whom Hitler inherited when he came to power and couldn't easily get rid of, not in the beginning. I wondered, well, imagine yourself actually as one of those diplomats going to work each day knowing that you were under surveillance, that your, your phones were tapped and your uh, actions were monitored. What was that like? And then what was it like after the night of the long knives? in 1934, just a year and a half into the regime. This was the first purge in the regime when the SS and the Gestapo rounded up the heads of the SA, the brown shirts, and shot them in cold blood through the night. Those murders actually took place not far from here in Lichtefelde. What was it like to go back to work after that? What most people don't realize is that the Nazis also used this occasion to intimidate the foreign ministry. One or two of the uh, people in the foreign ministry were shot across their desks in the Wilhelmstrasse, in the foreign ministry. Others were carted off to concentration camps, and some just fled into hiding. So imagine the tension when you came back to work the next day. We tend to think that in violent dictatorships, or any dictatorship, the people around the dictator just tell him what they, want, what they think he wants to hear. But I found that wasn't the case, that actually, rather than becoming more risk-averse, the advisors became more risk-taking. And they did that through the control of information, the only weapon they had at their disposal, by uh, manipulating, withholding, you know, uh, or withholding altogether key bits of information on its way to Hitler. Well, that had an effect on major decisions in the lead-up to World War II, including even Stalin's decision to sign the Nazi-Soviet Pact. Obviously, we would never look to the Nazi regime for lessons about wisdom, but for those who were working against the regime from within, I think we can definitely say that wisdom does need a free flow of information and is never likely to emerge in a climate of fear. All right, let's turn to book number two, Breeding Bin Laden's America, Islam, and the Future of Europe. This is a book I started working on in uh, the early 2000s, at the start of the global war on terror. And here I wanted to understand why the European governments and the American government were alienating the very people they most needed and wanted to attract, moderate religious Muslims. And so I, I found that they badly misunderstood that group. I spent the better part of five years off and on traveling across Europe to many different points, talking with uh, terrorist suspects, Turkish fundamentalists, religious leaders, but mostly just plain folks and focusing on younger Muslims, people in their 30s, 20s, and late teens. At the time, the survey data and the uh, policy recommendations all were saying that there was a deep-seated anti-Americanism in this group and anti-Europeanism. That's not what I found. But I did find that there was a deep ambivalence toward perceived mainstream 
European and American values. And governmental policies were missing this crucial nuance. I think if governments want to craft wise solutions, they have to get beyond shallow survey data and superficial stereotypes about groups of people if they want to have a positive effect on certain groups. Okay, let's turn to book number three, Blunder, Why Smart People Make Bad Decisions. Yes, you can see by the cartoon image that it was meant as a popular book. And I started thinking about it while working on the policy planning staff at the Department of State during the lead up to the invasion of Iraq. And I kept thinking, the people around me are not dumb. So why do they think that this is a good idea? And, you know, being a history nerd, I looked to history for clues. What I did was to cast a rather wide historical net to range across time and cases. And here's what I found. Whether we're talking about international relations or romantic relations, whether it's about how we treat mental illness or physical illness, whether it's about how societies raise their boys or how countries raise money, we all sometimes fall into cognition traps, rigid ways of approaching and solving problems. And so the book offers historical and contemporary examples of the seven most common and pernicious cognition traps. Now that's not because there are only seven, but because my editor refused to let me have more than seven. <laughs> so apparently this is what happens when you do a commercial book. Uh, but what I did learn, among the many things I learned from the research on this book, is that when governments want to produce wise decisions, they are best suited to it when they have individuals who are genuinely open-minded, imaginative, and empathetic. Okay, let's turn to book number four, A Sense of the Enemy, The High Stakes History of Reading Your Rival's Mind. Most of us struggle to read other people. Sometimes even people we know extremely well can really surprise us. So it's much harder, obviously, to read someone in a foreign culture, with a foreign background, someone who may think very differently from us. And I think a country struggle, America has especially struggled. It's had a hard time reading Putin or the Taliban, uh, Vietnamese leaders, and so on. So I wanted to know who in history actually did this well. And when they did it well, was it luck or did they have a method? I was working on this uh, while well, a fellow at the Stanford Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences. And I decided to look at the uh, major conflicts in the 20th century and figures who I thought were doing it well. So how Mahatma Gandhi, for example, read the British, or Gustav Stresemann, the man running German foreign policy for the 1920s, much of it, how he read the Russians, uh, or Les Zwin, the man running North Vietnam, and how he read the Americans during the American War. And uh, what I found, I can reduce to a single sentence, but it's a little complicated. Let me give it to you. The people who read their enemies best did so, not by focusing on the enemy's pattern of past behavior, but by scrutinizing their behavior at pattern breaks. That sentence takes about five seconds to say, maybe five minutes to explain, and probably took me five years to fully appreciate its, its implications for foreign affairs. And to my surprise, it's actually pattern break analysis has been proving helpful to some people in the national security community. Okay, let's, I'm gonna skip over my next book, which was a, a guide to graduate students to help them elevate their academic performance. Not relevant for our purposes here, so let's move to book six, which I published last year, and what I learned from it. This is not who we are. America's struggle between vengeance and virtue. It is understandable that in wartime, hatred of the enemy would run extremely high, and calls for revenge can be intense. It's understandable and to be expected. And exactly the opposite was true. I was very surprised to discover that during World War II, in crucial cases such as the internment of Japanese Americans, the decision to drop the atomic bombs, and others, most Americans and most top officials actually favored mercy, not revenge. They were opposed or deeply ambivalent about the harsher policies being pushed through, and yet a minority managed to push their vengeful policies through. I wanted to understand how this happened and why. 
Okay, I'd be happy to talk about any of these books at uh, the Q&A or separately later if you wish. But stepping back from it, I think you can see that these books are not just about how governments make decisions. They're really about how governments screw things up. And uh, I feel like it's finally time for me to focus on those moments when governments do produce something meaningful, positive, lasting, especially those decisions that foster peace. So with that in mind, let me turn to part two and dig a little deeper into a story about a wise decision. And I'm going to take another break for a drink. Thank you. Okay. Well, our story begins in 1944, but I'm actually going to start it in the year 2000, because that's when the Brookings Institution posed a question. What was the greatest achievement of the US government since World War II? And some 450 historians, historians and political scientists weighed in what do you think they chose? Would anyone like to venture a guess what that group might have chosen? The best, the wisest, most effective policy that the US government pursued from the end of the war to the present, to 2000? Nixon and China. Nixon and China is a good guess, thank you, okay. Marshall the Marshall Plan is what they chose, very good. A plus to that young man in the uh, seat, okay, good. <laughs> thank you, Glenn, okay. <laughs> the Marshall Plan, why? because it blocked the spread of communism, rebuilt Western Europe, and cemented America's influence for the next 75 years. So how did it come about? <laughs> I think looking back, we can say that it was one of the wisest decisions that America ever made. So was it the result of a uh, great general, George Marshall, who persuaded his country to an act of charity? Or was it uh, farsighted presidential leadership on the part of Harry Truman? The answer is, that it wasn't even the original plan at all. The Marshall Plan was a reverse course, and it was needed to replace the previous occupation policy, which was a complete disaster. Now, most Americans don't know very much, if anything at all, about the Morgenthau Plan. They've probably never heard of it. In contrast, Germans tend to learn about it, but I think what they learn is not entirely complete. So let me give uh, a background and explain what exactly was going on here. In 1944, it's becoming clear that Germany is going to be defeated, and President Roosevelt's advisors need to come up with a plan for occupation. And Henry Morgenthau Jr., the Treasury Secretary, decided that the German people should be punished severely. And so the Morgenthau plan that he presents is somewhat draconian. The idea is to strip Germany of all heavy machinery and return it to an agrarian state so that the German people will be left to live off of carrots and cabbage and whatever they can produce. Most people in the administration thought that this was a terrible idea. And it was most uh, well articulated perhaps by Henry Stimson, the, the war secretary. Stimson thought that uh, you should make Germans stakeholders in a stable and prosperous Europe and that by imposing a punishing peace, it would only sow the seeds for future conflict, much like happened after World War I. He also understood that Morgenthau's plan would lead to widespread starvation. And so they battled back and forth. Now, why was Morgenthau so intent on punishing the German people? Well, the obvious answer that most give is that he was Jewish and he wanted revenge. But I think there's some context here that is often missed. Morgenthau had a second job. In addition to being treasury secretary and funding the war effort, he was also made head of the secret rescue board. That was a group inside the White House that President Roosevelt gave discretionary funds to. And their role was to bribe officials, guards, ship captains, anyone they could to smuggle Jews out of Nazi-occupied Europe. And in the end, they managed to bring about 200,000 Jews to America. Um, in that role, 
Morgenthau was receiving detailed reports of the horrific mass murder of Jews in what would come to be known as the Holocaust at a time when most Americans had no idea this was going on. So I think it's, we have to say that this clearly shaped his perspective. Nonetheless, uh, some kind of compromise had to be reached between the differing factions inside the regime. And when they hammered out a compromise, it was still pretty harsh. Morgenthau had a great deal more influence than is generally appreciated. Uh, what they produced was called JCS, or Joint Chiefs of Staff Directive 1067. That was the occupation policy for the first two years. And uh, one of the ways in which it was extremely harsh is that it said that the occupying forces would not be allowed to help Germany rebuild its economy. The language said uh, Germans will be left to, uh, to use whatever facilities may be available. But there were no facilities available, and the effects were grim. Children were starving en masse, and adults struggled to survive on very little rations. It was grim. Now, Morgenthau is actually soon fired by Harry Truman in 1945. So you might ask, well, why, if he's out of government, does it take two more years for the policy to be reversed? Well, that's because Morgenthau wasn't done. He had a two-pronged strategy to keep the pressure up for the harsh peace. One was over. He published a book called Germany is Our Problem. And in it, he laid out the case for why the harsh peace had to be imposed. And you can read in it such sweeping stereotypes about Germans, that they are militaristic, bloodthirsty, and all the things you can imagine. To do that, he had to overlook the millions of people who actively worked against the Nazis, the Social Democrats, the Communists, many Catholics, and so on. You had to ignore the fact that at its peak, the Nazis never got more than a third of the vote, and that was the second to last election. In the final election, 1932, their percentage of the vote dropped substantially, and that encouraged Hitler to make his move. So all of this had to be ignored, as well as the fact that his sweeping policy would be punishing children, millions of them, who could not possibly have been blamed for what happened. So um, he did one other thing in his attack, and that was covert. He was a bureaucratic manipulator, great maneuverer. He got uh, one of his loyalists, Bernard Bernstein, on to the staff of General Lucius Clay, who took over from Eisenhower to uh, keep the pressure up. Eisenhower, I'm sorry, Clay, was the head of US occupation forces. And this man, Bernstein, yes, also Jewish, was convinced that the harsh policy was necessary. So his job was to make sure that General Clay never went soft. But in this effort, he failed. Because Clay had a change of heart. He realized that uh, he couldn't take the suffering that he was seeing all around him. Uh, much later in his memoir, he wrote something I'll quote for you. My exultation in victory was diminished as I witnessed this degradation of man. I realized then and there, never to forget, that we were responsible for the government of human beings. And so Clay flouted his orders, along with some of his other officers. And they worked to subvert JCS 1067, the official occupation policy, and even gave some of their own food to starving Germans. <coughs> Within two years, at last, finally after two years, the policy was reversed. Now, why did the shift to the Marshall Plan occur? There are many reasons from, uh, it was a drain on taxpayers, uh, you needed a strong German economy to help the rest of Europe recover, and the humanitarian uh, issue was often overlooked, but extremely important, I wanted to stress that. But those are all the particular details about the Marshall Plan. And what I wanna do now in part three very shortly wrap up by saying, what does this episode suggest to us about how wise decisions emerge more generally? And I think that there are three main factors that help produce them, or at least have helped produce them in the past. Factor number one, folly. Wise decisions tend not to emerge from uh, a point when everything is going well, but instead they tend to arise from the ashes of failure. It took this policy, uh, JCS 1067, to be exposed as a total failure before something wiser could replace it. Factor number two, friction. Oftentimes, you need people working at odds against each other in order for the airing of differences to make 
wise decisions more likely. And finally, factor three, well, I should say, if folly and friction were the only things you needed for a wise decision to emerge in government, then obviously the US Congress would be the wisest body in the world. <laughs> and since we know that that's not true, there must be something else. Factor three, pain. Yes, it seems that wise decisions are not simply part of rational thinking, but they tend to emerge from a deeply emotional process, typically the observation or experience of suffering. And this was true also of the three cases I mentioned at the start, Botswana's, uh, Botswana's independence, Vietnam's transition to a market economy, Northern Ireland's Good Friday Agreement. It also appears to be true of many other cases I've been examining. These three factors, folly, friction, and pain, are probably not alone sufficient to produce a wise decision, but they do seem to have been necessary factors in the mix. Okay, I'll just close with a few final words about why I'm so passionate about this project. When nations act unwisely, innocent people can die. Hundreds of thousands in Iraq and Afghanistan, several million in Vietnam. But when nations act wisely, the effects can be life enhancing. It's my hope that this project can illuminate not just what makes a policy wise, but also show us how to get there. And if it's successful, maybe, maybe, it can point the way towards some lasting solutions to some of our current global crises. Thank you so much. Zach, thanks for a great talk and for exciting us all about this project. Now, as someone who dropped out of his history PhD program, I would like to hear about the other book, the one you didn't talk about, <laughs> because I still have dreams about my incompletes. But um, <clears throat> for the sake of everyone else, um, I will forego my selfish interest in, in that issue. So, um, I suppose my first question is um, about the relationship between Blunder and this book, because it seems like they are, you know, um, in some ways, mirror images. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious if you would talk a bit about that relationship. Did, did you finish Blunder and know this was your next book? Or um, ha, ha, we'll talk about that relationship mm -hmm. between those two books. That's a great question. Especially Thank because you. Yeah. Yeah, you were there, you were present at the destruction when um, Iraq was, the uh, decision to invade Iraq was made. I was, on the, I was then out of government watching it and saying, how could you be such idiots? But I'm interested in your, uh, in your thoughts. Thank you. That, that is a great question. I did not know then that I would work on a book on wisdom, but I absolutely, it was clear to me that I needed to understand what was going wrong and why such smart people could say things that seemed uh, untenable in their arguments about the invasion. And I felt that casting a wide net was really necessary. I didn't want to just write about um, international relations because I felt like you had to dig down to the individual level. There are times when it's helpful to look at the big, big circle of uh, the structure of the international system or within that domestic political politics and so on. But sometimes you have to get down to the unit level, the individual, and understand how people are thinking. And I wanted to do that not just in international relations, because I thought that some of the same mistakes we make 
in our thinking about international relations also is true of our thinking in other realms of human activity. As I mentioned in the talk, from international relations to romantic relations. I mean, we sometimes screw things up. This was really a book about um, times when people genuinely wanted to do the right thing and ended up shooting themselves in the foot. So I defined a blunder as a solution that makes matters worse. That's what a blunder is, not just a mistake, but a very specific definition. And so by going to that individual level and casting a wide net, it did get me on the track of thinking about wisdom. And it turns out, I, I look back on it now and I realize that this was published in, uh, I think, 2008. And uh, the final chapter was called Working Toward Wisdom. I had forgotten about that when I, <laughs> when I started this new project. I went back recently and looked at it. And uh, I was really trying to get at what is it that the individual needs to do to get closer to wise decisions. And when I looked at all of the cases that I covered in the book, three things stood out. I mentioned in the talk, to reiterate, true open-mindedness, really meaning flexibility of mind, openness to information, openness to new ideas, imagination, the ability to creatively come up with new solutions, think out of the box in, in that cliche, and uh, three, empathy, that we really need people who can either experience or observe suffering and feel it and want to do something about it. We could stop there, mm -hmm. okay. um, but we won't. So I'm going to um, I'm going to leap ahead to a question that I assume you're going to have to deal with in this book, mm -hmm. and uh, I'd like your uh, preliminary thoughts on it. And that is whether democracy itself isn't sometimes just at odds with wisdom because um, we often really don't have the wisdom of crowds. We have the impulses of crowds mm -hmm. at work. And watching policymakers, as, I've, as I have, always trying to square the circle, circle the square, or figure out how they can possibly advance the political interests of their masters, um, and deal with a policy problem at the same time is just maddeningly difficult. So I'm curious about your thoughts on that. I know we're all strong, small D Democrats here, but it is um, a problem in the system that is, um, uh, you know, bedeviling us. And in fact, the whole issue of the Marshall Plan is one of the really interesting ones because that was a rare occasion where a government um, devise the public relations strategy to get the kind of um, public impulse that they needed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad you asked that. I actually believe that democracy is essential to wisdom and that dictatorship or author authoritarian regimes are very unlikely to produce wise decisions precisely because of uh, two of the three factors I mentioned, friction and pain. In friction, it seems that you need to have that friction, that airing of differences, allowing for the thinking through and refining of ideas. When you don't get that in an authoritarian regime, when you have someone at the top saying, here's what we do, you usually get blunders or you're more likely to get them. Not always, of course, but as a general rule. So I think it's, democracies are actually much better suited to producing wisdom. It's unfortunate that folly seems to have been necessary at the start before the wise decision could emerge. So let me reframe the question this way. Is it really necessary to have folly, friction, and pain in a democracy to produce a wise decision? I don't think it's necessary to have folly. It seems that it has been necessary, but it shouldn't have to be that way. Friction probably is necessary, as I just mentioned, and pain, <coughs> and when I say pain, I really mean empathy, it probably is also very necessary. Not just the experience and observation of suffering, but the desire to do something about it. So if you have people in place in a democracy who really do want to do something about it, then you're better suited to come up with a wise decision. That's my answer. Okay. Um, I am going to ponder, I think Zach is three steps ahead of me on all of these. So um, <laughs> I am gonna ponder some more questions, but I see that there are hands already, there are many hands already up. That must be a great, a great talk. You've already really uh, uh, 
uh, stimulated the uh, the uh, neurons. All right, um, I'm going to start right here. Wait for the microphone, and please make sure there's a question mark at the end of the question. Yes, thank yeah. you very much for this great talk. Um, the three examples you uh, showed or you talked about it were all men. And I would be interested when we talk about <coughs> empathy, when we talk about mm -hmm. a specific kind of mindset or attitude that puts other people first or next generations first and not yourself, how do you look um, at the difference between m decisions made by men and decisions made by women? Great question, and it is something I thought about as I prepared this. Um, I would love to have a mix of men and women in the book as I go forward. The problem for me is that I'm focused on the 20th century, and most of the heads of state and people of power have been men. And so my pool uh, sample is somewhat smaller for women at the highest levels of power. That doesn't mean, though, that I have to stay at that level, uh, I may be able to find good examples of women leaders, both in and out of government, and see how their empathy and their uh, other thought processes and qualities helped lead to more wisdom. So I'm hoping that I'll be able to do that. And if anyone has suggestions for people to consider and cases to think about, I'm very open to them. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna go right back there in my effort to go front and back. Thank you. Right. It was a wonderful talk. As you can see, everybody uh, reacts. I wonder whether um, these three factors that <clears throat> you highlighted, whether two of those, and that is pain and uh, failure, could be viewed as antecedents of wise decisions, and whether friction could be seen as a mechanism that actually generates uh, wise decisions based on the experience of fear and uh, of pain and fa uh, failure. And if this is the case, would it make sense maybe to analyze <coughs> uh, processes of friction by using uh, <coughs> dialectical materialism? Tell me what you mean by dialectical materials. <laughs> Well, good old Marxist theory. Okay, okay. Well, that's not normally been my approach, uh, but uh, it could be possibly useful. Uh, I think you're, you're right and, and wise to think that there is uh, value here in examining friction as an antecedent. Uh, as I tried to lay out, because I'm at the embryonic stage of this research, I don't have a thesis, I have only these inchoate thoughts. And really, I think I should frame these as observations, more than even uh, such a strong word as a hypothesis. The folly, friction, and, f and pain uh, framework is tentative, but I think, yes, antecedents is certainly something that we can think about, that they help to produce, that they need to come together, but that there must obviously be more than this that produces wise decisions. And uh, I think it's going to require getting into maybe not uh, Marxist analysis, but more uh, individual psychology and group dynamics, bureaucratic behaviors inside government, uh, and even international relations uh, and what's happening in the international arena, because that can affect wise decisions as well. Thank you for that. Zach, that was a works. Mm -hmm. That was a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Um, I'm curious to th see what you think. Oh, we can understand macro ideologies um, influencing your observations. I'm thinking of the Cold War ideology, which just blankets so many decisions of foreign policy in the United States from '45, and the, especially for Latin America, the plethora of big mistakes made as a result of that. Um, and which everyone is blind to alternatives, given anti-communism, et cetera, et cetera. So let me ask you, I'm sorry, probably just stepped away from the microphone, but maybe you can 
crystallize your question. What, tell me, I understand what you've said, but tell me exactly what you'd like me to answer. So, so if, if anti-communism is, is such a deeply felt ideology in government and society and is adopted and believed in by the overwhelming majority of people, how does one, in the way you're understanding this, get beyond that? Or how, does, how do these wise decisions come out of this hugely powerful way that people understand the world? Jim, that's a great question. And it takes me back to Chongqin. And here was a, a group of people, not just he, but also uh, the party leaders and so on, who were really true believers. And that shaped their thinking so deeply. He clung to those views for decades. And then something happened. Now, as I gave those three examples, each time I said, and then something happened. It's the something that I want to figure out, <laughs> okay? That's what I want to know. What was it? Well, in that case, it's again that people were starving. In the late 70s, so after the end of the third Indochina War, <clears throat> average people, average Vietnamese, are struggling to find food. The, the whole quota system is leading to rationing and nothing, and production quotas, nothing is working right. People are cheating the system. They're lying about their records. This typically happens. And there's also a shift in the international arena. So there's a big backdrop that's helping to shape his thinking and making him realize, you know what? Those policies, which didn't work very well before, definitely aren't going to work now because things have changed. He's recognizing that a whole slew of changes have occurred and that seems to be shaking him into open-mindedness, uh, the kind of uh, flexibility of mind that is needed for a wise decision to emerge. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll stop there. I hope that, that that answers that. What I'm trying to say is a number of changes have to come together sometimes to break people out of their ideological mindset and help them see that they too need to change and embrace some new ideas. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, wouldn't you agree, though, that um, suffering may be a, a necessary precondition for wisdom, but it it's um, not the case that all suffering leads to wisdom That's by right. any means. Of course. There are lots of, Certainly. Lots of really uh, <clears throat> depressing cases about that. Certainly. Okay, I'm looking back here. Okay, so I hope you hear me. Um, thanks for the talk. So I would have two questions, um, if it's okay. So the first one would be on a very basic level. What is a good judgment or what is a wise decision? I mean, obviously it's a philosophical question kind of, but do you have a definition? Do you more have a, let's say, common sense definition of, uh, of a good uh, judgment and then you would just go on and intertwined with that, I would say is, would you say that author uh, authoritarian regimes or not regimes, uh, whatever, systems um, make wise decisions despite not having friction, for example? Or how do you explain good decisions of authoritarian uh, systems? If you agree that there are uh, wise decisions uh, of those, yeah. Okay, let me take the first question first. Thank you for that. Uh, so let's have two definitions. How about one very simple, basic, so we have something to talk about. Wisdom I would simply call good judgment, but then we need something more. So I would define a wise decision as a solution that provides the maximum benefits possible to all stakeholders for at least a generation. I'm talking about wise decisions in government. Now, I'll break that down for you. So obviously we can't have the standard utilitarian idea that we want the greatest good for the greatest number because then the smallest number or smaller numbers, uh, the minorities usually get the short end of the stick. So that is not gonna work. If we think about uh, the greatest possible benefits for all stakeholders, then we're thinking about everyone from those who seem like perpetrators or the wrongdoers in a situation. They may have grievances as well that need to be addressed. The whole concept of restorative justice and restorative practices is based around the idea that everyone in a situation should be seen as a stakeholder and have buy-in to a solution, and that you'll get a wiser decision when you're thinking about all stakeholders. But then we have to think about 
wisdom and wise decisions not as a binary category where we've either created a wise or a foolish decision. <coughs> Instead, I think we have to think about wisdom as operating along a continuum. And then we're just striving toward ever wiser decisions, knowing that we can't ever get exactly to perfection. But these should be our goals. And I think uh, in dictatorships, you are less likely to get them. That doesn't mean they're not possible. So if the question is why do they sometimes produce wise decisions despite a lack of friction, uh, I don't know the answer to that, but I would like to look into it. I think though that uh, you might have a situation there where you've got a law of numbers issue. And the more, <laughs> more decisions you produce, and you're producing countless of them in government all the time, some of them are going to end up being wise simply by probability. There are other reasons, of course, that would lead to a wise decision in a dictatorship, but and that's my short answer. Thank you. It might be in that, in that context interesting to look at Deng Xiaoping and the re China reforms. Yes where you have a dictatorship. He obviously did have um, uh, suffering, so um, yeah. that might be yes. uh, an interesting case to look at. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, right here. Thank you. Um, yes, Wait I for the have... microphone, please. Thank okay. you. I have some uh, remarks for Mr. Shore, not questions. Um, no, we you... want questions. Okay, did you what hear? Do you want to give him your remarks afterwards? No. Did you hear <laughs> about the, the Harding Institute of uh, Risk Management and Decision Making? Um, it was founded by uh, Professor Gerd Gigerenzer. And um, have you heard about him? So, so I think um, to make a good decision, it takes some risks. It also takes um, some um, gut feeling. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I met uh, Professor Gigerenzer at a conference once, and we have a basic disagreement about how these things work. And uh, uh, but I think it would be too long and involved to to go into in this forum. But uh, I respect his work, and uh, I think he does important uh, make important contributions and so I will I have addressed his work previously actually in the epilogue of a sense of the enemy I specifically write about him and his work and I'll lay out there my differences of opinion and so if you're interested maybe you that could be one more sale of a sense of the enemy <laughs> okay thank you uh, Michael Sorry. Now you're next. Never can call on you. <laughs> I was wondering if I you're, you're next. I didn't see your hand. Oh. Raise both. Zach, I wanted to ask you about the education of decision makers. And it seems to me if you put folly, friction, and empathy at the center of the story, there's one good place to get education for decision makers, and that would be in the arts. Uh, which is not often how many of our decision makers are, are educated, but it does occur to me in that context that the Marshall Plan is not really George Marshall's project, it's George Kennan's project, and he was probably the most literary uh, of all American diplomats. So have you seen in your work any connection between the arts, you know, literature, graphic arts, uh, drama, and, uh, and, uh, and wisdom? Michael, I'm, I'm very impressed by that question. Uh, because it's as if you read my mind, I actually published an article long ago about that very topic, about how uh, decision makers could learn a lot from screenwriters, from uh, actors who do you know, method acting, character acting, and so on, uh, and the different ways that novels uh, and literature could help improve governmental decision making, exactly along those lines. It was published in a rather obscure journal, so I'm, I'm, no one, unfortunately, ever saw that probably, but uh, uh, thank you for, for thinking about that. So I completely agree. I think it's a very valuable training That was training a setup. Tool. Yeah, it's clearly a setup. That could have no. been a planted question, but it wasn't, oddly yeah. enough. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. This is so helpful. And um, I wanted to build on the first question and, um, and on Michael's question. Um, the first thing about women and... Um, decision making. As you were talking, I was wondering who was in the room? Who 
gets to weigh in. So that's the first question. Where do you draw the boundaries of who gets to talk? Mm -hmm. And the second one is um, kind of building on what Michael said about the arts. I would go into partisan um, history, and that is the history of the Democratic Party in the 20th century. And the, the woman whose name came to my mind was Fannie Lou Hamer. And the moment was at first 1964, and then the subsequent changes in the way the Democratic Party works. I don't know, I mean, you're talking about governments, this is about a partisan history, mm -hmm. but that might be a way of um, enlarging and maybe answering more questions about who gets to weigh in. No, I think that's a great suggestion. Thank you so much. I would love to look into that. How about at breakfast tomorrow? We, <laughs> <laughs> we you know, give me some tips on what to read. Thank you. Uh, Julian, over here with um, Ariel. Thanks. Thanks for the inspiring talk. I have a practical question um, for a um, two-day subject. What's a wise decision with respect to uh, Vladimir Putin and Ukraine? <laughs> Thank you for the easy uh, question. <laughs> <laughs> you want to punt it to Michael? No. <clears throat> no, I, I, I would, would certainly defer to Michael for his expertise. And I think one thing a wise person should not do is speak about things they're not knowledgeable about. But if I can step back and speak more broadly, not all the specifics of, that, of the current war, I would say it's very hard for people to sometimes understand the difference between understanding and exonerating. Sometimes when we want to understand how another side thinks, it sounds like we're engaging in exculpation. We want to say, uh, they're not to blame because of this or that. And that's not the case. I think if we want to resolve conflicts, you absolutely must try to see things from another person's point of view or another side's point of view. I think Vladimir Putin uh, appears to be, based on what I have read, a murderous dictator who should probably be, if it's all true, or if any of it is true, should probably be hanged as a war criminal. That would be in a just world. But uh, since we don't always get to live in that world, uh, I think we should also try to look at how he and Russia might see some of the problems in this conflict. How would the United States feel if Russian military power and influence were, say, 100 miles from the U.S. mainland. We actually know the answer to this question. Right, it happened in the Cuban Missile Crisis, and what did we do in America? We were willing to risk World War III to get them out. Now Putin finds himself with American NATO influence 100 miles from his home city of St. Petersburg. I think it's not entirely unreasonable for there to be real Russian security concerns. None of that could possibly justify what he's done and launching attacks on civilians and infrastructure, launching a war to begin with. None of this is acceptable. But what it means is that when it eventually comes time to bring this war to an end, when the Ukrainians feel ready, and they have to, if they must, or, I mean, ideally, there would be a total victory and uh, they would force Russian troops back to the pre-invasion borders. That would be the ideal situation. We might not get the ideal. So when the time comes for a negotiated settlement, if that's what happens, we're going to need to take into account some understandable Russian security concerns. And so I think wisdom would tell us that a wise decision and a wise settlement would be one that treats even the aggressor as a stakeholder whose interests at least have to be understood. That doesn't mean that they're appeased or pacified or, or rewarded for their aggression, but that some stable peace can be constructed. Normally, it's only by taking into account and understanding 
other side's concerns. I hope that was clear. Okay. Yes, thank you. Hello. Thank you. Uh, that was a lovely, uh, wonderful and interesting talk. I um, have a question concerning historiography, I guess. Um, I mean, how do you deal with the conundrum that um, the question of whether a decision was wise or not only appears in retrospect, right? So you, how do you deal with the difference of, you know, the, the messy nitty-gritty of every day that you will encounter in the archives, um, you know, the multitude of voices competing with each other, um, and the and the and the and the narrative of something being a wise decision in retrospect, right? Um, I would be curious of how you, yeah, but how you how you deal with that tension. It's a wonderful question. Thank you so much for that. It's what I've had to deal with in all of the previous books I was <laughs> describing in the talk, uh, but specifically about how you determine whether it's a wise decision after the fact. Uh, being an American, I'm tempted to make an analogy to American football. I hope that that would be clear, uh, but more, I'll try to be more general. When a coach has to make a decision, and uh, it's one that has, say, a 90% probability of being the right decision, say, to kick a field goal in American football, uh, and then it turns out that it, was, it didn't work out. They missed the field goal. And it turns, it looks in retrospect as a bad decision. I don't think that's how we can judge decisions of any type, but especially wise decisions. I think we have to judge them not simply on outcome, but also on how uh, they were constructed and what information was available to the decision maker at the time. So it can be a perfectly wise decision, even though it ends up horribly going horribly wrong, because there are always variables and intervening factors that occur, and you can't control those. So to judge a wise decision, it's important not just to look at the outcome, but to look at the process and the thinking behind it. That's my feeling. Okay. I would like to ask a follow-up to that mm. one. Please. One, of, <clears throat> I think as most of us who've worked in government have observed, um, the, the high road to a bad decision runs through groupthink. Mm. But at the same time, uh, good decisions are rarely the result of a light bulb going off over an individual's head without any further discussion and consultation. Have you thought about how you get the latter and not the former, that is to say, the deliberative process that uh, will, would produce that as opposed to uh, the groupthink that is absolutely endemic? Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what drove the blunder book, actually, because that's what I was seeing happening. Uh, and my solution was, it's, <clears throat> historians are always giving qualifications, saying it's more complicated than that, there are all these factors and so on, but people want simple answers, they want things to be reduced. So what I tried to do in the blunder book was to suggest that what would really help avoid groupthink is to be cognizant of cognition traps. If you could run down a checklist when you're making a decision as a group and say, wait a minute, could we be guilty of? And then I gave each cognition trap in the book and they're right there on the table of contents so that it would be an easy guide for policymakers should they ever want to use them. And sometimes they actually do. Uh, to say, okay, are we guilty of chapter one? Exposure anxiety, a fear of being seen as weak. Or are we guilty of this other cognition trap? Infomania, an obsessive relationship to information, hoarding information or avoiding key information that usually leads to blunders. So what I think can help avoid groupthink is becoming cognizant of the most common cognition traps we all fall into. Once you're aware that they exist and understand them, it's much easier to spot them. And in fact, after writing that book and reading it, I was starting to see cognition traps everywhere. You know, you start seeing, my God, it's happening all the time. So I think uh, this is one way of combating groupthink. Okay. Do you have a question? You want to just think, um, it's wonderful wait, to listen. Wait, oh, you have to wait for the microphone or no one okay. will hear you speaking. 
on on the Zoom. It's wonderful um, listening to what you're saying, <coughs> and I'm I'm simplifying a message, and I want to uh, to ask you if you would agree. There's no wise decision without empathy. It seems. It's very possible. I'm a cautious person by nature, and I don't like to say never, ever. <laughs> but let me say this. I've yet to come across a wise decision that did not involve empathy. Thank you. Genji. Just, just following up on the empathy thing, with so many of our leaders completely lacking in empathy or being really off to the side on the psychopath spectrum. <laughs> what do you do when empathy is not a factor at play? How, how, it, because it does seem like there are a lot of people in power who, who simply don't possess it, understand it, etc. Great question. The answer is both simple to answer and extremely difficult to implement. We have to change the way that we elect people. And we have to do that by being willing to make bold changes, I think. We always resist and react to new ideas by saying, well, that'll never happen. They'll never get that passed. You can't make that change. That's impossible. But every major change happens over those objections. I mean, that's how it works. So I would say, Look at the different ways that are already being introduced around the world for voting systems, from uh, Condorcet, uh, uh, ranked choice, preference voting, and so on. Beforehand, people said, oh, you can't change the way people vote. But some people said, we need to try a new type of system. So what if we expanded on that and said, since you have to take an exam to be a surgeon or a doctor, you have to pass the med exams. <laughs> and you have to pass the bar exams to be a lawyer. Why can't you have to pass an exam to be a political leader? But that exam should be testing for the qualities that wise leadership requires. Meaning, not just knowledge of particular subjects, but we also need leaders who are empathetic. What if there were a way, we might not have it yet, but we could develop it, maybe, we could at least try, to test for empathy? What if an fMRI could actually test <laughs> by showing someone scenes of horror or upsetment and see how they register on an fMRI? I don't know if it would work. It might be unreasonable, but I'd like to find out. <clears throat> we'd... <laughs> and somehow we'd have to figure out ways to prevent people from paying other people to mm -hmm. take the test for exactly. them, which is a common problem. You had a question, Christine. Thank you. Um, government decisions, um, wise and otherwise, are made in the public eye, uh, very much uh, publicly viewed. Um, I'm wondering if you've given some thought to how social media is changing the way governments make decisions, the ability of wisdom to proceed from the decision-making process. I was very struck by uh, your remark about the Marshall Plan and how a information campaign had been uh, created to prepare the US public for the Marshall Plan and make them more receptive and open to something that might look like otherwise helping the enemy or the former enemy. So how or how and if and how, how and if does social media complexify uh, decision making and the emergence of wisdom in government decision making? Well, it's a great question and it certainly does make things more complicated because uh, we're not all getting exposed to the same information. And uh, I believe I read, I may be mistaken, that the, is it the Berkhoff Foundation and uh, 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 Andrew Gilmore is here tonight. Have they or another group, I may be conflating them, but uh, there's a group in Germany that has done some work on uh, how teens respond to and uh, understand conspiracy theories and can spot conspiracy theories online, in social media, and so on. That kind of work we need much more of. It's a very difficult thing uh, to get the right information, accurate information, out to people and then get them to be receptive. But I guess 
the one thing I would add to that is that we, I think foolishly, tend to think that most people are going to be making rational decisions and that by presenting them with information that is accurate, somehow they will make a clear, rational decision about it. And I think we need, obviously, real facts and rational thinking, but they often have to be combined with emotional messages. Take, for example, environmental campaigns. I don't want to go on too long, but I think that the greater someone's intelligence, often, the more they can think in abstractions. E equals MC squared is such an incredibly abstract concept, even to get your head around, much less to come up with it. But a great many people don't have the ability to think that abstractly. I think that's a fair statement. Most of us, myself included, could not think that abstractly. For many others, metaphors are even difficult. Many people take texts literally. It's very hard for them to think abstractly at all. And so when we talk about, say, in a social media campaign, protecting the environment and so on, this can seem like an abstraction to many people. It just doesn't have meaning. And so we need to focus media campaigns on things that actually do resonate emotionally with people in ways that don't seem abstract. For example, their children. People might not understand uh, the, you know, the, the fact that... Uh, Icebergs are melting far away. But they can understand that they want their children to have uh, clean drinking water and a better life and uh, anything that connects messages, wise messages, to people's less abstract, more concrete, immediate emotional responses, I think will be much more effective. Thank you. <clears throat> we have lots of hands, mm. and we have no time. Mm. And that is truly... Um, Depressing, but uh, I think I can say with some confidence that we have a fantastic inaugural Bertolt Bites fellow. And thank you very much, thank Zach. You. That was terrific. <laughs> and, um, and I should add that I think I'm going to limit the amount of suffering in my future, but I would really still like a morning tutorial on wisdom, if that's okay with you. Um, every third day, every other day? Um, okay, um, I will just tell you what's up ahead. On Tuesday, October 8th, Max Strassville will give the Gerhard Casper Lecture, Traditional Jewish Literature and Trans Politics. That will take place here at 7.30 p.m., uh, the day after, our Mary Ellen Funderheiden fellow in letters, uh, Ayanna Mathis, will read from The Unsettled, a novel. That will take place uh, at the U.S. Embassy Literature Series at the English Theater in, um, in uh, Bergmann-Keats, English Theater Berlin in Bergmann-Keats. And then we will have uh, one of Washington's most sought-after election analysts, Doug Sosnick, who was political director in the Clinton White House, will come back to Berlin. He has been here before. And um, he will talk about, guess what, the 2024 <laughs> presidential race. Um, <clears throat> this, part, this is part of our Road to the Election uh, 2024 series. And it will take place uh, somewhere in Berlin, Mitte. We will have that location for you soon. So for more information, Go to the website, check the newsletter, um, and follow us on social media. Uh, and once again, I want to thank um, our speaker for an absolutely uh, fabulous uh, talk, and also thank again Ursula Gatter and the Krupp Stiftung for making this all possible. Zach, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.